the dubious morals of Victorian life now on BBC Two and the extraordinary actions of three scandalous women prepared to force a change. The surprising side of the Victorians. In Victorian England, a woman, regardless of her social position, surrendered virtually all her rights from the moment she married. The only woman who was exempt was Queen Victoria. This is the story of three women who scandalized Victorian society by breaking the rules and exposing the hypocrisy and sexual double standards on which these ancient laws were built. I have done very wrong. We never hear it carelessly or complacently asserted of a young woman that she is only sowing her wild oats. I do not ask for my rights. I have no rights. I have only wrongs. Under English common law, a married woman like Caroline Norton did not exist. In the eyes of the law, she was a non-person. She was a formidable woman, an acclaimed poet and songwriter, admired for her wit and her beauty. Some men found Caroline sexy. I think most of them found her provocative, but they reacted, of course, in different ways. Some were bowled over by her. Two um, professors from, from the United States were, she said, spiffly cated by her. They didn't know how to deal with such charm. Other people found her frightening. One described her as terrible, dangerous, beautiful. And Tennyson couldn't stand her. He thought it was like sitting next to a snake at the dinner table. At literary gatherings, Caroline was often the only woman present. She was the granddaughter of Richard Brinsley Sheridan, the playwright. As a prolific and successful writer, she was a literary equal amongst men. But Caroline needed to marry well, because her family was poor. She married a man she barely knew. He was a lawyer and MP. George Norton, heir to Lord Grantley, was obviously um, related to an aristocratic family. He seemed all right. He owned acres up in Yorkshire. And I think that Caroline thought, well, if she could manage him, she could after all manage any man, couldn't she? Of you and your friends hiding me. I enough. Initially, her reaction was one of shock. She didn't know how to cope with it. And we must remember that she was still going to social receptions in the evening. I imagine she, she covered up any bruises that perhaps may have been seen otherwise. But their marriage was certainly a loveless one. Early in their marriage, George had revealed his darker self. He hated cleverness, especially in a woman. He wanted a wife who was silent and obedient. Caroline was neither. The Sheridans were all Whigs on the radical side of the Whig Party, the Liberal Party. And therefore, reform and, and radicalism was in their very blood. But unfortunately, Caroline could find as a husband only a man who was a Tory MP. They didn't get on well even politically. Things became even worse when George lost his parliamentary seat. Caroline used her political connections to try to help him. She wrote to a family friend, Lord Melbourne. Intrigued by her letter, he decided to call on her in person. Caroline, don't let me, don't let me interrupt you. As a young woman, she met Lord Melbourne. As a Whig minister in the new government, he was Home Secretary. And she asked him for a job for her husband. Thanks to Melbourne, a job was found. 
George became a magistrate and spent most afternoons in court. <laughs> Lord Melbourne called on Caroline two or three times a week in the afternoons and spent several hours with her. And this went on for some years. It was a great romantic friendship. He was flattered by the attentions of this young woman. She felt herself honoured by the attentions of such an eminent man. There was once an old castle that stood in the middle of a large... Despite the terrible unhappiness of her marriage, Caroline's three sons gave her great joy. Old fairy. All the day long, she flew about in the form of an owl. She was a devoted mother. This is really the nicest thing about Caroline Norton. She was kind, she was loving, and she was only too delighted to spend almost all her time with them. And we must remember that she was a very successful writer, and she had a an extended social life, but these came second, in her opinion, to her, the time she spent with her children. On one occasion, this was when she was pregnant, he knocked her to the floor, he kicked her, uh, so that she lost the baby. The law allowed men to beat their wives, but a man must not beat his wife with a stick thicker than his thumb, in case that actually hurt her. Caroline was trapped in this marriage. By law, George owned everything. If she left him, she would have nothing, not even her children. <laughs> Outside her own family, only Melbourne knew how badly she suffered. You ought to know Norton better than I do, and must do so. But you seem to be hardly aware what a gnome he is. He is possessed of a devil, and that the meanest and basest fiend that disgraces the infernal regions. But he advised Caroline not to leave her husband. He was worried by the savage speculation in the press about the exact nature of their friendship. <laughs> then, in April 1836, George Norton accused Melbourne of committing adultery with his wife. I don't know what would happen today if the Prime Minister went out to meet a young woman three times a week, but he did. And the Tories got wind of the fact that if they could make a scandal of this, they could bring the government down. And therefore, eventually, Norton was persuaded, his arm was twisted, to bring an action against the Prime Minister for what was then called criminal conversation. The case was sensational. Melbourne was now Prime Minister, and it was the first time that a Prime Minister had been sued for adultery, or criminal conversation, as it was called. Melbourne's future was in the balance, and so was the destiny of the entire Whig party. Neither man appeared in court and left their eminent lawyers, Attorney General Sir John Campbell and Sir William Follett, to battle it out. But Caroline, as a legal non-person, was not allowed to appear in court to defend herself. The potent mix of sex and politics captured the public's imagination. The press was there in force. The Morning Chronicle sent a young journalist by the name of Charles Dickens. At an early hour yesterday morning, the entrances to the court were thronged with people. They were eager to procure any place from which they could hear the smallest portion of a trial which has excited so much interest. The public learnt about the trial from Dickens' report the next morning. Several of the Norton servants stood up to testify against Melbourne. John Fluke, their coachman, was the main witness for the prosecution. Did you observe how her dress was? The clothes were up on Mrs. Norton's left leg, and I saw the thick at the knee part of the thigh. On cross-examination, it became clear that Fluke had been bribed and coached by Norton to lie. I really don't know. But if you were called upon to work, sir, I dare say you would like to be paid for it. The jurors were unanimous. They found Melbourne not guilty of adultery. And the Prime Minister, Lord Melbourne, was found not guilty of criminal conversation with Norton's wife. I think this enhanced his reputation. Um, everybody thought what a jolly old soul he was, and good heavens, what a man. 
Melbourne abandoned Caroline. Despite being found not guilty of adultery, her reputation was ruined. She was labelled a scandalous woman and overnight banished from polite society. George Norton punished her even further by taking her children from her. Mrs. Norton? The children. She discovered them in the hands of Miss Vaughan, his mistress. I came away without being able to even kiss my children and say goodbye. If he keeps my boys from me, I shall go mad. Caroline slowly learned just how ruthless George could be. And as a lawyer, he knew the law was on his side. So Caroline determined to fight him by mastering the law for herself. Caroline discovered to her amazement that what property she had, what little bit of money she'd inherited from her own family, the quite considerable money she earned as a writer went straight to her husband, not to her. Everything belonged to her husband as soon as she married him. And that was true for all women in the Victorian period. But there was even more to it than that. She discovered that she did not exist in law. What she uncovered, she expressed in her pamphlets and letters and to her friends. <laughs> I desire to point out the grotesque anomaly which ordains that married women shall be non-existent in a country governed by a female sovereign. A married woman in England has no legal existence. Her being is absorbed into that of her husband. An English wife has no legal right even to her clothes and ornaments. An English wife cannot legally claim her own earnings. No, An English wife may not leave her husband's house. No, but... She cannot claim for libel. No. She cannot bind her husband by any agreement. Oh, yes. My husband is a lawyer, yes. and he has taught me every quirk and quibble of the tyranny of English law. Caroline now embarked on a personal crusade to establish separated women's rights to their children. But she encountered great opposition, especially in the Tory press. The British and Foreign Review wrote, Such a perjury as that but a she-devil could do. She-beast! Can this woman be either a wife or a mother? She enlisted the help of Whig politicians and lawyers who were sympathetic to her cause. Caroline's voice was heard in influential places. The Infant Custody Act was passed in 1839. It made legal history by giving separated women rights to their children. When the New Infant Custody Act was, was passed, I think Caroline thought, ah, at last, she would have the opportunity to see her three children, who had grown up considerably since she last saw them. But George Norton was a very canny, he was a very cunning man, and he removed the boys to his estates in Scotland. For six years, she barely saw her children. One day, she received a letter telling her that her youngest son had been thrown from his horse and was seriously injured. An utter stranger met me at the railway station. I said, I am here. Is my boy better? No, she said. He is not better. He is dead. And I found, instead of my child, a corpse already coffined. After her son's death, George permitted Caroline to see their two remaining children, but only occasionally. The battle with George continued when he cut off her allowance. In spite of her considerable literary income, she fell deeply into debt. She actually was George Norton in law. So she thought, well, if the law regarded her as George Norton, well, then she may as well stoke up some bills, which he would have to pay. Norton refused to pay her bills, and eventually one of her creditors took him to court. They couldn't take Caroline Norton to court because she didn't exist in law, so they took the husband to court. And this time, 
Norton turned up, and so did Caroline Norton. Mrs. Norton, what is your literary income? Is it not £500 per year? I am here of justice. George called justice. Caroline as a witness, intending to expose her as a liar who hadn't revealed her true income. We are not residing together and have lived apart for some years by my wish and choice. Because I consider that I have sustained an injury that no woman ought to submit to. He stipulated that I should give up my children, and I said I would rather starve than lose them. I did starve for a time. Did you not derive an allowance from the late Lord Melbourne? From the moment the questioning began about Lord Melbourne, I lost all self-possession because I then saw all the cruel baseness of Mr. Norton's intention. I felt I no longer stood in the court to struggle for an income, but to struggle against infamy. What does the witness say? Let her speak. I cannot hear her. My husband can cheat because I am his wife. God damn it. It's not regular for me to say but a word. It is all irregular. You wish to disgrace me, and I throw it back upon you. Mr. Norton, will you have the goodness to sit down? Your Honour, it is really... Caroline now knew enough about the law to play George at his own game and expose him for what he was. For 17 years I have concealed these things. But they come out today because you bully me. And I am ashamed for your client if he does not feel ashamed of himself. I do not ask for my rights. I have no rights. I have only wrongs. The court case was a turning point for Caroline. Her moral victory over George inspired her to continue her crusade for justice. She was enshrined in a fresco in the House of Lords as justice. Caroline won a further victory in 1857 when the new Divorce Act incorporated her recommendations that divorced and separated women should have rights to their earnings and property as well as to their children. Yet the struggle for equality before the law had only just begun. The sexual double standards that continued to exist in both the bedroom and the law court would also engulf this young woman, Harriet Mordaunt, in one of the biggest scandals of the Victorian age. She was young and pretty. He was wealthy and respected. Harriet married Sir Charles Mordaunt in 1866. It seemed the perfect match. Darling old Charlie. But behind their happiness, there lurked a potential for scandal. When it came, it would cause panic in the heart of the establishment, even the royal family itself. Before her marriage, Harriet already had royal connections. She had seven sisters and six brothers. It was a very big family, and I think very carefree and easygoing. And of course, the Prince of Wales and his friends had very cleverly managed to extend the London season to Scotland. And they go from country house to country house up there. And the Moncrief establishment was part of that circuit. And the Prince of Wales used to go there. He loved it. There were, there were all these lovely girls. And I think he was very fond of those girls, particularly Harriet. After her marriage, Harriet kept up with all her old friends and admirers from the fashionable fast set. She was beautiful, undoubtedly, and very vivacious. The prince really liked vivacious ladies, slightly tomboyish, I think he preferred them to be. I think she was probably quite shallow, immature at that stage, and she was a fun-loving girl. The fast set was rapidly gaining a notorious reputation, especially its leader, the Prince of Wales, who, a hundred years on, is celebrated as Dirty Bertie. Purveyor of the pornography to H R H K. Down is the Prince of Wales. Buy a bunch of dirty birds. He's down is the Prince of Wales. I'd have tattooed on me check for all to see when I am dead. 
Quebec, a very colorful royal crest. Fire appointment. Well, they had a wonderful time on these house parties in the country houses, apart from all the shooting and the hunting and so on. They managed to creep from room to room. I'm not quite sure how it happened. Also, it did happen in daylight. Mr. Charles is not in the social set that his wife was, his young wife, and Harriet's parents. They were quite glad to see Sir Charles come along and ask for Harriet's hand in marriage. And I think they perhaps were glad to get her married off straight away, imagining that perhaps that would be the end of it. Charles was an MP and a highly respected member of the community. His parliamentary duties and country pursuits frequently took him away from home, a fact others took advantage of. She wasn't at all sure whether she really wanted to marry this rather dull Warwickshire squire. But her friends said, well, we'll come and see you. So she really made it a condition of accepting. He was so much in love with her and so keen to have her that he said, all right, yes, go ahead. Charles had made it a condition of his marriage that Harriet should not continue to see the Prince of Wales. But the future King of England was not easily refused. He would hand his hat to the butler, which was a sign that he intended to stay. If it was a brief visit, then he would have kept his hat with him. And then he would go into the drawing room with Lady Mordaunt, and strict instructions were given that they were not to be disturbed. <laughs> The prince and his set developed this rather clever ruse of having an affair with a young married lady who was still cohabiting with her husband. So that if the worst happened and they did become pregnant, of course there was no way of telling whose child it was. And the danger, of course, of associating with women of the streets was this much dreaded and very prevalent venereal disease. Harriet and Charles had been married 18 months when he went off on a long fishing trip to Norway. My own darling Harriet, I am writing while still in the steamboat, but we are just going to arrive in about an hour, all safe. We have had a tolerably quick passage, but very rough. Indeed. My own darling I Charlie, very thankful you were not here. I hope you did not have a very rough passage and feel very ill. It has been blowing a good deal here and it is fearfully hot. I miss you very much, but I am... When he did come home a little bit early, because the fishing wasn't very good and he'd sent a telegram that didn't arrive in time, he found the prince standing at the front door, watching while Lady Mordaunt trotted round in front of him in a pretty little pony carriage drawn by two ponies, which had originally come from the prince's stable. He was really incensed, Sir Charles, you can imagine, and in the white heat of his anger he gave orders that those two ponies should be brought out onto the lawn in front of the conservatory and shot dead in front of the eyes of his horrified wife. Eight months later, Harriet gave birth to a little girl. Although it had been a straightforward birth, she became distracted and troubled. She'd found out that one of her friends from the fast set had been infected with venereal disease. I want to ask you one question. Is the child disease? Is it born with a complaint? Harriet was beginning to fret that she had contracted the disease and passed it on to her baby. When the baby developed an eye infection which didn't respond to treatment and was really very severe, Lady Mordaunt was convinced that it was going to become blind by venereal disease. And she felt that this was all her fault. Charlie, you're not the father of the child. Lord Cope is the father of the child, and I myself am the cause of its blindness. Oh, Charlie, I've been very wicked. I have done very wrong. With whom? Lord Cole. 
and Sir Frederick Johnson and the Prince of Wales and others. Often, and in open day. Harriet was quite sure that they'd work out some solution because people did. People got into these messes and they were sent abroad and so on. And I think in her innocence she thought that he would forgive her as he seemed to forgive her for everything and that she'd go on as if nothing had happened. It turned out that neither Harriet nor the baby were infected. But she completely underestimated the effect that her confession would have on her husband. He was devastated. Adultery was shocking enough. To have confessed adultery with the Prince of Wales was unbearable. Charles felt he had no option but to divorce Harriet. When Harriet's father, Sir Thomas, learnt of Charles's intention, he took action. With five unmarried daughters, he had to find a way to avoid the shameful stigma of divorce in the family. So he rushed to Walton Hall. When Sir Thomas, her father, went to see his daughter, he went straight upstairs and saw his daughter, came downstairs and said, poor thing, she's mad. This was a great shock to Sir Charles and all the servants, but they began to realize that this was the scheme, that if she could be proved to be mad, then she would never be able to stand up in a divorce court and give evidence. After mutual prayers to heaven, child and Psychiatric doctors were sent to examine her. Harriet's father had determined to sacrifice his daughter for the sake of family honor by instructing her to feign madness. Either convinced by her behavior or colluding with Sir Thomas, all declared her mad. I think I'm crazy. I'm crazy or mad. I shall pretend to be mad for a bit. It would do Sir Charles good. He deserves to be beat. I know what I've done. I know what they want. I know what you all want to come here spying on me. But I will not be treated as if I were nobody. I hate you. I hate myself. I hate everyone around me. Give me poison and let me die. It's all pain and no pleasure now. The men who Harriet had consorted with just denied everything, and they didn't come and stand up for her, as perhaps she hoped they would. I think this was probably a big shock to her. Her prince deserted her, and all the other men as well. What was meant to be a divorce case, in fact, became a trial to establish whether Harriet was sane or not. The trial opened in London with the testimonies of Sir Thomas's eminent doctors. One who had a vested interest in the outcome was the Prince of Wales physician, Dr. William Gull. Call Dr. William Gull. I saw Lady Mordaunt on six different visits. She had an absent expression and a meaningless laugh. Call Dr. William Priestley. Her memory was almost annihilated. She could understand nothing but the simplest thing. Call Sir James Alderson and considered her of unsound mind. I think I could distinguish an insane person in the dark by the smell. So distinguished were Sir Thomas's expert witnesses that he was convinced the case would be over in one day. But a surprise development came when the judge, Lord Penzance, called for evidence of Harriet's behavior prior to the baby's birth. This meant that the court would rule on Harriet's sanity at the time of her alleged adultery, before she had the baby. The scandal was out. Had there been anything leading to these proceedings to disturb the affectionate relations between Lady Mordaunt and yourself? Nothing whatever. Sir Charles Mordaunt and his lawyers now had their chance to put the case for Harriet's sanity, evidence which might allow him to divorce her. 
Were you aware that His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, was an acquaintance of your wife's? I was. Did he ever come to your house upon any invitation of yours? Never. I was lady's maid to Lady Mordant from the time of her marriage until she left Walton Hall. In arranging her toilet table in her bedroom, I found a letter. Where was it? Under a pincushion on the table. Did you read the letter? I did. Give the contents of the letter, as near as you can remember. It was dated Saturday and addressed Lady Mordant as Darling. Jessie Clark, Harriet's personal maid, was the first of the servants called to testify to her infidelities. The names of the men she'd been involved with were now revealed. The Prince of Wales chose to defend his name. This was the moment the crowded court had been waiting for. If Bertie was exposed as an adulterer, there could be political consequences reaching far beyond the divorce court. Queen Victoria took no chances and contacted her Prime Minister Gladstone, who had a quiet word with the head of the judiciary. I believe your Royal Highness... The heir to the throne had nothing to fear in this court of law. I have. Were you acquainted with Lady Mordaunt before her marriage? I was. And Sir Frederick Johnson and the Prince of Wales and others. Just one more question to trouble your Royal Highness with. Has there ever been any improper familiarity or criminal act between yourself and Lady Mordaunt? There has not. And there was a tremendous cheer in the court there, quickly sort of stifled by the judge. But uh, it was quite a dramatic moment. And the important thing was, I think, that there was no further cross-questioning. They left it at that. Queen Victoria wrote... The fact of the Prince of Wales's intimate acquaintance with a young married woman being publicly proclaimed cannot but damage him in the eyes of the middle and lower classes, which is to be deeply lamented in these days when the higher classes in their frivolous, selfish and pleasure-seeking lives do more to increase the spirit of democracy than anything else. On the last day of the trial, the judge, Lord Penzance, reminded the jury that although the men, including the Prince of Wales, had acted with impropriety, it did not make them guilty. The jury, all men, then retired, and ten minutes later returned to face the court, and declared that Lady Mordaunt was totally unfit. Poor Harriet, if only she kept her mouth shut, how different it would have been. The set that Harriet was in really was the key to her behavior in a sense. I think she also began to realize Sir Charles's worth and she th kept saying he's so good, he's so different to all the others. And wisdom given after mutual prayers to Harriet was the victim in a battle between two powerful men, her father and the Prince of Wales. Feigning madness was to cost her dear. Her crime was adultery. Her punishment was to be locked away in an asylum until her death, 33 years later. Queen Victoria now ruled a quarter of the globe and her empire was at the height of its power. But to maintain this power, new laws had been passed that would further impinge on the human rights of women. On a hot summer night in 1864, a new act called the Contagious Diseases Act was hustled through Parliament by stealth. It was said Queen Victoria thought she was giving the royal assent to a cattle bill. The truth was, the animals in question were prostitutes, and the contagion was venereal disease. Henceforth, they are no longer women, but only bits of numbered, inspected, and ticketed human flesh, flung by government into a public market. Remember these women... That One woman who was brave enough to speak out against this legislation was Josephine Butler. She'd grown up in a family steeped in reform and radical politics, and she believed passionately in women's rights. 
we cannot move wholly and fully. Josephine was a very, a, a womanly woman, very highly educated, refined, cultured background, um, a deeply spiritual woman, but also a woman with, with a strong sense of, of social justice. The butlers had three sons and a little girl, Eva. One day their lives were shattered by tragedy. Eva broke her neck and never regained consciousness. She died two hours later. Never can I lose that memory. The fall, the sudden cry, and then the silence. It was pitiful to see her, helpless in her father's arms, and her beautiful golden hair, all stained with blood. I became possessed with an irresistible desire to go forth and find some pain keener than my own. My sole wish was to plunge into the heart of some human misery and say to afflicted people, I understand. I too have suffered. Soon after Eva's death, the family moved to Liverpool, where George Butler took up the post of head teacher at Liverpool College. Liverpool was one of Britain's fastest growing cities, a heaving mass of humanity and a place of great wealth and abject poverty. Josephine was shocked by what she saw. There are two million and a half of women for whom there is no alternative but starvation or prostitution. Here in Liverpool, there are 9,000 who follow this profession because there is none other open to them. Among them were girls as young as 12 years old, and it was not against the law to have sex with them. Many ended up in vast institutions like Liverpool's Bridewell Prison and Workhouse. There was little chance of escape, and many died here. Though prostitution was endemic, it was a social stain few would touch. At last, Josephine had found the cause she was so desperately seeking. There was a bridewell for women consisting of huge cellars, bare and unfurnished with damp stone floors. These were called oakum sheds. I was taken into an immense, gloomy vault filled with women and girls, more than 200 probably at that time. She was not judgmental. She treated prostitutes as, as equals. She called them her sisters, women that, that were regarded as the outcasts. Prostitutes were called the, you know, the sewers of society. I sat on the floor among them and picked oakum. They laughed at me and told me that my fingers were of no use for that work, which was true. But while we laughed, we became friends. In the Bridewell, she met a young woman called Mary Lomax. Mary Lomax is, is the first prostitute that, that she took into her home. She just went over to her, uh, started to stroke her hair away from her forehead. Um, and, and Mary later said that was the turning point in her life, Josephine stroking her hair. She, she'd never received human kindness before. When I think of how she found me. Mary was just 19 and had TB and she was thrown out of her brothel in Liverpool as soon as she became ill and started coughing up blood. So torn with pain and sickness. Just before Mary died, she wrote a poem for Josephine. Stanley, Josephine's son, wrote it down. How sweet she said she loved me. Even me, the wicked one. I mean, it must have been an extraordinary thing to take these prostitutes into their own home, and they seemed to have filled every spare room, every attic room and, and, and cellar with, the, with these girls. Um, and there was no question of, of keeping them segregated from, from the boys. Uh, Mary Lomax's bedroom was, was right next to the boys' schoolroom. Um, and these girls really became part of the family. In Victoria's army, marriage was discouraged. The regiment was the family. 
prostitution was considered an essential sexual safety valve for the men. It was estimated that one in three soldiers was infected with venereal disease. The Contagious Diseases Acts were brought in to control VD. They forced prostitutes to be physically examined every fortnight to check they were free of disease. The Contagious Diseases Act stripped women of their civil liberties, of their legal rights, and they had no means to protest their innocence. Um, if, if, they, if they refused to be examined, then they were put in prison until they did submit to the examination. Josephine was horrified that the government was sanctioning what she called the state regulation of vice. She began visiting brothels and prisons in the garrison towns to discover for herself how the legislation was affecting women. Later, Josephine described the experience as descending into the jaws of hell. I have spoken with the authority about the examination. I'd like to hear from you what happened. It's awful. The attitude they have towards us is disgusting. Once a woman had been arrested, she would have to sign a voluntary submission form, which of course was not voluntary. They would be put in a, in a special chair. Sometimes their legs would be strapped down. Then they thrust in these horrible instruments, pull and push them about. A lot of these women were pregnant or menstruating at the time. It, it was a terrifying procedure. And if you cry, they stifle you. Under the acts, not just prostitutes, but any woman in a garrison town could be arrested and detained by the police. The instrumental violation of her person caused her great pain and copious flooding. The police spy went to her home, into her bedroom, while she was ill and wretching. That poor girl was threatened with miscarriage. Nothing wears me out, body and soul, as anger. And this thing fills me with such hatred that I fear to face it. But face it she did, and the rallying cry was a protest published in the Daily News. It was the brainchild of the Ladies' Association for the Repeal of the Contagious Diseases Acts, led by Josephine Butler. When the petition was delivered to Parliament, there were 2,000 signatures. One MP wrote, Your manifesto has shaken us very badly in the House of Commons. We know how to manage any other opposition in the House, but this is very awkward for us, this revolt of the women. It is quite a new thing. What are we to do with such an opposition as this? The campaign for the repeal now began in earnest. The campaigners set up their own printing press to publish their journal, The Shield. Josephine's husband, George, was her chief ally and support in the campaign. He was a very modern husband, giving her his blessing when she was going off on her speaking tours around the country. She talked about their life as being, you know, a united life. But he also talked about her as, as a great politician. As, as a great statesman and he talked about her saying that if any of his friends asked him about a political question he would say well I must consult with my wife first because she has the political brain in the family the root of the evil is the unequal standard in morality the false idea that there is one code of morality for men and another for women it is a false and misleading idea that the essence of right and wrong is somehow dependent on sex. We never hear it carelessly or complacently asserted of a young woman that she is only sowing her wild oats. Josephine was often advised by male colleagues to moderate her language because she often spoke very strong language. Uh, she called the examination of prostitutes a surgical rape. She was prepared to use words like that. Um, and she refused to tone down her language. Where are these victims to be got? It is the children of the poor, the daughters of the working classes who are forced to minister to the so-called necessity. In parliamentary debates, MPs would actually stand up and ask, well, where will our sons go for sexual experience? 
It is a cowardly thing of the upper classes to make a law which tells against the interests of the poor so that they may keep up the health of their armies and navies and their own pampered sons for whom these acts were made. Yeah. Working men, can you bear the thought of it? Never. If prostitution is a necessity, I call upon Mr. Cave, Colonel Alexander, and Mr. Gaythorne Hardy each to contribute a daughter. <laughs> Josephine became more outspoken as she grew in confidence. As the campaign gained momentum, the opposition became more vicious. One of her most terrifying encounters was during the Pontefract by-election. The meeting had just begun, and Josephine would never forget what followed. The bundles of straw beneath had been set on fire. Then, to our horror, we saw appearing head after head of men with countenances of fury. There was no possible exit for us, the windows being too high above the ground. It was not the personal violence that we feared, so much as the mental pain inflicted by the rage, profanity, and obscenity of the men. The fire had been started by her political opponents. Josephine and the rest of the women eventually escaped by leaping through a trap door. She not only faced political opposition, there were even prostitutes who opposed the repeal. Ironically, many prostitutes believed that the acts were a good thing because they felt that the acts legitimized their profession. They would have certificates saying that they were clean women, they were free of disease. Some of the women would even pin these behind the bed for the men to inspect. And some would even call themselves the Queen's women. The Victorian age was nearing its end, but its double standards lived on. Josephine's attacks on sexual hypocrisy among the upper and middle classes had made her powerful enemies. But her voice was now being heard throughout the country, particularly amongst working-class men who'd recently gained the vote. It was also being heard in Parliament. Her unrelenting campaign finally persuaded Liberal MPs to vote for the repeal of the Acts. Her battle had lasted 16 years. She observed her victory from the ladies' gallery. Victoria finally gave the royal assent to the repeal of the Contagious Diseases Act in 1886. I thanked God at that moment that Queen Victoria had washed her hands of a stain which she had unconsciously contracted in the first endorsement of this legislation. By the close of Victoria's reign, Josephine Butler had won a great victory for the rights of women. All three of these scandalous women had helped expose the sexual double standards that lay at the heart of a society riddled with inequality. A society which had been ruled by another woman, Queen Victoria. You can discover more about the lives and times of the Victorians.